Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for, for showing up. Um, so the topic of my talk is effective quantum dynamics. And um, maybe first uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of where my research area is located. Uh, I would say I work in um, mathematical physics. And the framework or the physical theory that I'm interested in is non-relativistic quantum mechanics or many-body quantum mechanics. And from a physical point of view, you could say the topics uh, lie in the area of non-equilibrium statistical physics or non-equilibrium dynamics. So I look at things that change in time. From a mathematical point of view, I mostly use techniques from analysis. Uh, so most of it is actually functional analysis. Uh, towards the end, I can tell you a little bit about uh, how it connects with more topics from harmonic analysis. And all the kind of equations I'm dealing with are going to be partial differential equations, PDEs. Um, uh, yeah, this doesn't work quite right yet. Uh, it doesn't give me the full slide in uh, the screen. Full screen. Yeah, go, go Maybe I'll switch to single page. Yeah, that should be single. This cuts off the lower half. Yeah, yeah exactly, yes. Um, OK, so the, the central uh, mathematical object I'm dealing with um, is called a wave function. Uh, it's a function in the Hilbert space. I denoted it here by psi t. t is a real parameter. It's for time. Uh, it lives in an L2 space, space, space of square integrable functions from R3n for three dimensions and n particles uh, into the complex numbers. And I don't want to get into what exactly the physical significance of that is, but it's really the basic object you're interested in in quantum mechanics. And it's a basis for describing atoms, molecules, electrons, the basis of all of chemistry, um, basis of semiconductors, computers, and so on. And the fundamental equation of non relativistic quantum physics is the Schrödinger equation. So it's imaginary unit, partial derivative with respect to time of this function is given by some operator H acting on this function. Now H is some self-adjoint operator I'll specify in a moment. So um, if we have some initial, so okay, the self-adjoint operator is the generator of a unitary group by Stone's theorem e to the minus IHD. So if you have any initial conditions, psi zero, that are square integrable, uh, you can calculate the wave function at some later time t. Now, the kind of operators H I usually look at uh, are composed of, um, of a differential operator. So here you have the sum of uh, minus Laplace operators acting on xj, just second derivative. Um, you could have more kind of operators there, other multiplication operators, external fields, magnetic fields. Um, but let me stay simple here. And you have a pair interaction potential. So you might have some real parameters in front, and then you have a sum over all pairs, ij, and then you have a real valued function of xi uh, minus xj, usually. And this potential is, is even. So it's uh, as the same value for x and minus x. <coughs> and um, so the general goal is now uh, to give approximations for this wave function psi because it's practically really impossible to solve analytically <coughs> or even numerically in any way. Numerical solutions are also hard because it lives on the n-fold uh, tensor product of, of L2. So this is a very high dimensional space which makes any numerics impossible. So you would really like to have approximations for this function. But you're also sometimes not interested in all the microscopic details of this function, but more about some sort of average values or some average behavior of this function. I'll also get to that in a moment. And um, OK, before I come a little bit closer to what exactly I do, um, let me tell you there are two fundamentally different kinds of particles in nature. You can classify all elementary and composite particles into these two categories, namely bosons and fermions. And here it means um, the bosonic wave function are symmetric under any exchange of variables. So sigma is here any permutation of 1 to n. 
you permute this variable, the function stays the same. Whereas for fermions, you change the sign for an odd permutation. So minus one to the sigma is just the sign of the permutation. So those two wave, function, wave functions behave very differently. Fermions, uh, for example, have to be zero uh, where two variables are the same on the diagonal such that you fulfill this constraint. So these functions look very different. And of course, if I choose my potential that way, then if I start with, init with initial conditions that fulfill this symmetry requirements, it'll stay like that for all times. Okay, so to formulate the kind of questions uh, in the most simple setting would be for bosons, where you choose this lambda n coupling constant as one over n. So then basically you have n terms here, you have n squared terms here with a one over n, you have something that for large n seems to be of the right order. So this is just a very heuristic um, uh, reasoning now. You have n terms here, n Laplacians, n kinetic terms. You have n squared terms here. And if you put one over n, you have both uh, of order n. So if you take like averages one over n, it's of the same order, but just very heuristically. So on the most simple state you could start with would be uh, an uncorrelated state, just a product state. So you choose just a so-called one particle or one body wave function in L2 of R3, and you just build a product out of this. This is a symmetric state, maybe the most simple state you could come up with. And then what you would like to show is that this structure of the state is approximately preserved by the time evolution. Okay, the first important remark is it's never exactly preserved because I have this potential that couples the different tensor components. But you could still hope that it's preserved in an approximate sense. And from physics, you can easily guess what the evolution equations for the, the, what the time dependence of this phi uh, function should be. Uh, namely, it's called the Hartree equation. It looks very similar to before. Uh, but now, instead of this parent action, you have basically plugged in um, the average value of the potential. So this here is the convolution of V with phi squared acting as a multiplication operator on phi again. So now you have, suppose you could show such a statement, then you have shown that the solution to the very complicated equation on L2R3n, uh, you can basically calculate with just um, solving this equation, which is now in a very low dimensional space, which is good for analytic and numeric techniques. Uh, but now you have a nonlinearity here. So this convolution makes this equation nonlinear, which makes it a bit harder, but that's uh, a good price to pay. And there are also more involved limits where the interaction, for example, becomes very singular. Um, if beta is some positive parameter, beta equal one is very interesting from a physics perspective. And then you get into uh, limits that are called nonlinear Schrodinger or gross pitevsky limits. And yeah, and these dynamical questions, there are lots of results. Um, this is a very incomplete uh, listing here. So the first results were in the 70s by Hepp, then by Herbert Spohn, uh, Erde, Schiao, and also Schlein, beginning of the 2000s. And maybe most recently, um, my advisor, my former PhD advisor from LMU Munich, uh, Peter Pickel, with some nice results. Uh, yeah. Uh, it gives an approximation to the, uh, yeah, so, th yeah, so this uh, would be unitary, yeah, yeah. So the questions I'm more interested in uh, concern fermions. So for fermions now, you have this anti-symmetry requirement. So the most simple, s simple state you could build would be not a product state, but an anti-symmetrized product state. So you choose uh, n different of these one-body wave functions, which you would like to choose, choose autonormal. So this expression makes sense. Uh, and then you still you have the product here, but you sum over all permutations and give it the right minus one factors, the right normalization. So you have an anti-symmetric state. Then, as I already said, the, the function looks very differently. So for example, for the physically very important case of Coulomb interaction, x to the minus one, that's how 
electrons or gravitating particles interact, um, you have a different coupling constant here. So the whole equation will still depend on n. You just choose uh, something much smaller, n to the minus, uh, something much larger, n to the minus two third, for example. So uh, I don't get into why this is a good or right number. But for fermions, you would ask a similar question again. You start with this anti-symmetric product state. You ask, is it preserved by the time evolution? And now the phi JTs are solutions to a, to a different system of equations. Now you have n equations here, one for each of the j's. You have one term which looks very similar to the one from before, except now you have the sum over all these phi k squares. But you also have one term which is called the exchange term, um, because you exchange one of the phi k's here with the phi j. This is a complex conjugate here, uh, which basically comes from the anti-symmetry. Anti so this equation looks uh, more complicated and is also much less understood than the equation from, from before in, in several respects. And the results in these directions were first obtained in the 80s, Nano Fazul, also by Spohn, then beginning of 2000s, Elgard Edel Schleinjau, and more recently, um, lots of interesting results by Benedicta Potter Schlein and also by Peter Pickel and myself. Yeah, of course, you have um, to set the right scale for the initial states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in general, this would be states which are of the same order of magnitude energy-wise of the ground state energies. Yes, of course, for very highly excited states, this, this won't be true. Yeah, okay. or depending on the time scale. Yeah. Your, your approximation is, it would be in what norm? Yes, I'll, I'll give you a sample theorem right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of the theorems I've proven with several collaborators last year, um, where you have really Coulomb interaction, which is a little bit technically a bit harder because of the singularity. Uh, you have this lambda n, this coupling constant, as it should be. And now let me assume I choose exactly this anisymmetric product as initial state. You can be much more general, actually. And uh, right, so now I can connect to two of your questions. So first, you have to set the right scale. So for example, for the kinetic energy, so you assume that uh, the total yeah, kinetic energy, or H1 norm, uh, is bounded by a constant times the number n, particle number n. <coughs> or in other words, 1 over n times the sum is just bounded by something independent of n. That sets me a, a scale for, for my initial state. And then what you can prove is that um, you take a one-body operator that acts only from L2R3 to L2R3, so it's not an operator on the full n-particle Hilbert space, but only on the one-particle Hilbert space. And it acts as an identity on all the other tensor components. Then you can show that the, so these brackets are the scalar product, that the expectations value, expectation values <coughs> in the real microscopic state psi t compared to the expectation value in my approximation uh, becomes very small for large particle numbers. So there's some exponential growth in time. But for all fixed times, you can make n so large that you can basically do all calculations with this state instead of the complicated one. Depends on the h. The bound depends on the h, on the norm of a. Uh, yes, the bound will depend on, on the norm of a, yes. Yes. So uh, you can also treat a certain class of unbounded operators, actually. But that becomes more, uh, you have to be more specific than what kind of unbounded operators. Um, okay, so or mathematically you can actually you can formulate it in terms of trace norms of reduced densities. Uh, I didn't want to introduce that because it would maybe take too long. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what one can do, so if you assume stronger conditions on your initial state, also nabla to the 4, a uh, norm is bounded appropriately, then you can, for example, improve this convergence rate in, in this case. So uh, th that might not seem so interesting here, why is, is it's important if it's n to the minus 1, 6 or n to the minus 1, half. Uh, but there's actually, from a physics perspective, there's something happening at n to the minus 1, third. So it's sort of desirable to get better than n to the minus 1, third. Is the difference? Does yeah. it have to be value the difference? Sorry? Those two numbers are positive. Ah. Is that there? Uh, yeah, sorry, I should, uh, of course, <laughs> absolute <laughs> values, yes, yes, of course. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so just to, to finish, let so me. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so it could be that here the dependence in T becomes worse than here. That's uh, technical reasons. So you sh would think that this, this is how it should be. Uh, also good physical reasons because more particles that behave badly, they can interact with those that are good, so you have exponential, you should have exponential growth. Yeah. Except if you start with an initial state which is very close to an excited state or so, to an eigenstate, then it might be possible to extend the time scales. Um, okay, so one interesting uh, question, for example, would be uh, one would actually think of time scales uh, to, to actually time scales n to the one third, so time scales longer in n for these problems before, if you choose a specific form of the initial state. There's some so-called semi-classical condition on the initial state. And then you get more into questions, uh, is this condition preserved in time? So you have to deal with more semi-classical analysis. Uh, another very interesting question, specifically if you choose this more complicated uh, Gross-Pitevsky scaling limits, is that you can actually give a more detailed approximation of your wave function. <coughs> I mean, before I showed you only the k equals zero term, where you have exactly the n-fold tensor product of a one-body wave function phi, but you can also um, take a sum over all k where you take the symmetric tensor product here with any k particle, with a certain k particle wave function. And actually you can show that this, there's a very nice equation for this uh, wave functions here, uh, which comes from a so-called Bogolubov approximation on Fox space. And this gives you, that's also a much simpler <coughs> equation than the fully interacting equation. Uh, but uh, it's, it gives you a much, much better approximation. This is also something that's very interesting. And uh, yeah, to bet uh, Jean is not here. I have this just for him. <laughs> so uh, the hartree fock equation, the time-dependent hartree fock equation, take, for example, a different dispersion relation like minus square root of the minus Laplacian plus m squared, which is <coughs> more interesting for relativistic systems. And you take a uh, focusing attractive interaction, like real particles, fermions, neutrons, or so in a star that uh, attract each other. Then you would expect that very similar to all these results from nonlinear Schrödinger equations, you also have, in this case, you would, uh, you would uh, expect a finite time blow up of the solution. Uh, but for if we exclude this part, so only take only the first part, then standard techniques work. But if we include the exchange term, uh, we actually don't know how to prove that. So it would be interesting to prove something like that and have some control over the properties, the time scales when the blow up happens. That would be a very interesting question. And uh, so, so you can ask also similar questions for different kinds of Hamiltonians, say for spin systems like um, in the Heisenberg model, where the Hamiltonian is, um, yeah, everything is defined on a lattice. We have here near some of the nearest neighbor pairs. And the Hamiltonian is given as the product of two spin operators at different lattice sites. So spin operators that, um, that obey the spin algebra here. And then you would also think that for low energy states, the spin wave approximation should should be true also for the dynamics of those initial states. So physically speaking, you would expect uh, this system to be describable by non-interacting <coughs> quasi-particles to, to leading order. And then you have to know, actually then you, you would think you start with an initial state that is very close to an eigenstate. So you actually have to get more into questions from spectral analysis. Um, yeah, so this would be some open problems. Uh, Thank you for your attention. <laughs>